Thank you so much for the invitation, and it's really been a pleasure to be here so far. Um, so today, I'd like to talk about this um, thing called the skein algebra that comes from quantum topology. I'm a low-dimensional topologist. And um, basically, I really want to, the, my main goal is to convince you why it should be something interesting, um, both from the topology point of view, and it's really also related to quantum theory from the quantum theory point of view, from the geometry point of view. So just a little bit of um, background, um, this um, about quantum topology in general. So um, in the early 1980s, Von Jones was working on these um, von Neumann algebras that came from statistical mechanics. And he um, realized that um, some of the constructions that he was seeing gave uh, invariant for knots and links um, in, in three space. And um, the, the, the construction was completely new. Topologists had no idea about it. Um, it was simple, it was combinatorial, and quickly um, it was used to prove some really old conjectures, like Tate's conjectures um, from knot theory that were 100 years old. Um, it was used to shorten proofs for, that used to take you know, pages and pages to something that takes about a, lot, a, a single line, for example, proving uh, that a trefoil and its um, mirror image are exactly the same. Whoa, what was that? <laughs> um, skip this version. Um, and um, so, so there was this explosion and this, you know, kind of this new thing that was really exciting for topologists. Um, shortly after that, Witten, um, working in quantum theory, realized that you can kind of amplify this um, Jones polynomial construction to give a invariant for three-dimensional manifolds, which was kind of, again, very exciting. Um, but this kind of um, was great, except the topologists were like deeply unhappy about this. Um, on, excited on one hand, but deeply unhappy in the sense that this construction didn't seem to relate to anything that they used to study, like fundamental group, um, homology, volume, all these things that, you know, number of crossings in a knot, all of these things. What in the world do these, like, quantum invariants measure? And actually, to this day, there's still no really good answer. We've gotten closer and kind of have bounds and have gotten closer and closer to understanding, and there's lots of conjectures, but there's no still um, answer. And so this is where... Maybe I did something. It's my computer's frozen. Like I can't even do it on the computer. Uh, let's see. There we go. Let me try it again. Enter full screen. Aha. Okay. So, um, sorry. Um, so this is where the Coffin bracket skein algebra comes in. It's um, a point. Uh, this construction has. Um, it was, comes directly from the um, quantum invariance, from the Jones polynomial and Witten's three-dimensional invariance. And, but it also is related to hyperbolic geometry and to, in particular, the SL2C character variety. And so um, it's um, an interesting thing to study. And um, so what I'd like to do for today is to kind of explain, um, start off with um, some definitions and a discussion of its algebraic structure, um, to talk about why it's interesting in terms of hyperbolic geometry and how it's related. And then finally, with some work on um, the representations of this thing, of this skein algebra. And um, all this work here is um, a longstanding collaboration with um, Francis Bonahan. Okay. So to start with, um, let's define the Coffin bracket. And it's an invariant of isotopy classes of uh, framed links in S3. And you can it's um, a reformulation of Jones' original conjecture, uh, original definite construction. Um, it, you can just um, change, a quick change of variable will give you back the original Jones. Um, and so how it um, is a polynomial, and so there's a variable. My variable will be Q, um, which Francis tells me I should call e to the 2 pi i h bar, which is the Planck's constant, but I really don't understand why that is true. But usually that Q is some kind of root of unity. We'll, we'll substitute it for a root of unity. And we'll also take a square root. So um, the Coffin bracket is computed for a framed link in S3. So a link is just a disjoint union of, simple, uh, of circles, right? And the framing is a choice of normal vector at every point. OK, so. Um, and how do you compute this? You draw a picture of it, and then from the picture you do some kind of rules, uh, combinatorial rules. So if you see a crossing um, in in the in your picture, um, you can replace it with the two resolutions of the crossing. Um, one where you go 
and this is counterclockwise, you put q in half as a coefficient of q half, the other one is q to the minus half. If in your picture you see um, a small circle that bounds a disk, so that's the important part, it bounds a disk, you can remove that circle um, at the cost of introducing a factor of minus q minus q inverse. Okay. And um, in all of these pictures, my convention is that the uh, normal vector at every point is perpendicular to, the, to my picture. So here's an example. Here's um, a link with one crossing. And so I can resolve it in two ways with the two different Qs, right? So if at the under I go counterclockwise, I get a positive one half um, exponent. And then if I go the other way, I get minus one half exponent. Um, each of these one, two, three are small circles. They all bound dis, right? And so I can remove them. And so there's two of them here and one of them there. And now I get a, a polynomial in Q. That's it. So that's the Kaufman bracket of the frame link. If I go back and I look at this other framed link, right? this one had just one circle. And so its polynomial is that. And so as framed links, this shows that these two are different framed links. Okay, So that's what I mean about it being invariant. Okay. Um, observe that. Um, if I had a, a picture with more crossings, I could just keep on playing this game, right? I have crossings, I resolve all the crossings, and instead of um, one number or one picture, I get a linear combination of pictures. In S3, all those pictures will be little circles, right, eventually, and they all bound disks, and so I can remove them, and then I get a polynomial at the end, right? So I, um, these Kaufman brackets will always be a polynomial in Q plus or minus a half. So here's another observation is that um, if I have two links, and I'm sorry, my, I, my two links are pretty easy right there. If I have two links and I put them uh, right next to each other, right, and I take this Kaufman bracket, right, so I um, undo all the crossings over here and keep this one the same, right, then you can see that everything will be a multiple of this, right, that, that'll be carried through. So actually this shows that um, if you think this this to the end, this shows that if I take um, the Kaufman bracket of two links right next to each other, just supposed, it will be the product of this one times the product of this one. Okay, And actually, um, there's no reason to have them next to each other. You can also put them right on top of each other. right? Because in S3, this is an isotopy. right? And so if I consistently put one on top of the other, you can either um, juxtapose or superpose. And you can get a multiplication of the Kaufman practice. So it's like, you know, multiplication. And it's commutative. All right. So this brings me to kind of understanding the algebraic structure of these Kaufman brackets, right? So um, to do that, I'm going to look at all possible framed links, all possible linear combinations to have them up to the skein relations. Okay. So again, I choose a variable. And right, so first off, I have all the possible linear combinations of all the possible framed links. And then this gives me, um, and then I mod out, this gives me scalar multiplication in addition. That gives me a module structure. And then um, I can multiply. And multiply is, you can, in S3, you get to choose either next to or on top of, right? When you take two knots, you can do either of those. And that will give you um, a multiplication. So as a topologist, every time you have the construction for S3, you immediately think, can I generalize this to any three-dimensional manifold, right? So here we go. Yes, you can. Um, suppose I am given an oriented three-dimensional manifold. I can do all of this, right? I can still take all possible linear combinations. I can still resolve. But at the end, I have this problem of in, a, in an arbitrary three-dimensional manifold, it's not clear what I mean, you could do juxtapose and on top of. Right? It's not always clear what that means. And not only that, it's not going to, in general, be compatible with the module structure. Right? You're going to have all sorts of problems. Right. It's free of rent one. It's exactly z, q, q inverse. Right. Exactly. Yeah, it's free of rent one. And um, for generic three manifolds, it's a module. And even then, like even it's hard to compute, given for simple things like lens spaces, just this module. Um, now, in, so today, I did say that there would be this thing called the skein algebra. Um, we can specialize to the case where your, your three-manifold is a thickened surface. 
okay? Not just the surface, but a little bit of thickness. I need the thickness so that I have over and under crossings. And in this case, um, you can run the same machinery, but at the end you get this multiplication. And the multiplication is by stacking. And actually, it's easy to see why this would work. So if you have a thickened surface, uh, surface cross zero one, you can take another thickened surface, surface cross say one two, and you can put one on top of the other and you get surface cross zero two, right? So you can extend this to links. A link in one of the thickened surface, link in another thickened surface, put it on top of each other, you get another link in a thickened surface. And so that actually um, works. And just as an example, let me, um, just to get used to this, um, suppose I have, uh, what is this, a torus with one puncture. Um, suppose I have a torus with one puncture, I thicken it up a little bit. Right, so here is a picture of um, a frame link in a thickened surface, thickened torus with one puncture. And in this case, I can resolve in two ways, right? I can either go counterclockwise or clockwise. There's the two, right? And so I have this linear combination, except that unlike in S3, I'm in stuck, right? Because none of these circles that I have there, none of them bound is, so I'm stuck. That's it. So it turns out that this um, skein module or skein algebra of this surface, of this thickened surface, has a lot of basis elements, right? There's a lot of linearly independent generator um, elements. Um, not only that, but um, another thing that is slightly different is that unlike in S3, if I put them on top like this, um, multiply superpose like this, it's going to be different than multiplying like this. Because in S3, I could just take them apart and then put them back on top of each other the other way. But I can't do that in S3, in, in a thickened surface. So for example, here, if I have this frame link, and I always put this, I don't know, the second one on top, right? It's going to be different than doing it the other, swapping, having them swap. So in general, multiplication is not commutative. Okay. Um, this is both good and bad, right? Because having interesting algebraic structure is always somewhat good. OK, so um, before I. I'd like to talk a little bit more about the algebraic structure and what we know about the algebraic structure of this um, skein algebra. Um, but before I do that, actually, I wanted to say why it's important, like, or why this is an interesting case. Um, so every three manifold can be decomposed into two handle bodies. You can take a Hegard splitting, right? And so you have two, these two solid handle bodies, very easy topologically. And to get any three manifolds, you just have to glue them together. Now the gluing is where the interesting stuff happens, right? So all the interesting th things, um, you can kind of decompose three manifolds and kind of think about the surface, the gluing surface instead. Um, so far, my definition of the skein module and skein algebra is a direct generalization of Jones polynomial. But it turns out that it's also um, the skein algebra of a surface and the skein modules are also really important in Witten's three-dimensional manif three manifold invariant um, and especially the topological quantum field theory version of it. So topological quantum field theory uh, in a nutshell is basically this machinery that assigns for every surface a vector space. And for every um, manifold with those surface, a surface those with every cobordism, a um, tr linear transformation of the vector spaces. But at the at the base, it's surface vector space. And in one version of the TQFT, Witten's TQFT, this vector space is just a skein module of a manifold whose boundary is that surface. Okay, and so um, now if you think about a manifold whose boundary is like sigma there's a natural action of the thickened surface on that manifold, right? So if you have a link in the thickened surface, you just slap it on where the boundary is, right? And so this gives you an action, and the action gives you an irreducible representation. And if we understood how this irreducible representation and how this algebra structure of the skein, surf the skein algebra of a surface works, then a lot of the computations of these quantum invariants become a lot easier. Yes, it's um, factors through. So um, there's the skein algebra, and then you can it fact, there's you could factor through the mapping class group, and then it's here. So it's kind of a generalization of the mapping class group thing. Yeah. So um, actually, what the mapping class group is is um, for every a, a curve, right, that you want to do Jane surgery on or Jane twist on, um, you color it by a special skein, and then you slap it on. To the manifold, right? So it's 
Any other questions? Okay. All right. So, um, so like we saw before, the skein algebra is in general not commutative. There, except in certain really, really simple cases. Right, so if you have a sphere, like a thickened sphere, everything in a thickened sphere is essentially the same as S3. Same thing with a disk um, or an annulus. So all of these are really, really simple surfaces where it is commutative. Otherwise, it's not commutative. Um, and there's also another case where it's commutative is when your variable, if you plug in a really, really silly number for your variable, basically 1 or minus 1. Because what happens then is that here, say you have an overcrossing like this, going, um, so if q half and q minus half are the same, then going left and right give you the same coefficient in front, right? So having this crossing res resolved with q half and q minus half is the same as this crossing resolved with q half and q minus half. Okay, so those are really um, basically the two. Um, there's some really silly things that we that was noticed, right? So if you have a little loop going around the puncture, right, that'll will commute with anyone you want. Because if you have another knot coming through, you make that loop really, really small, so then it, you can go you can move it up or down with respect to the rest of the link. So um, puncture loops will commute. Um, in the early 1990s, actually when it was defined, actually, it was proved that it's infinitely generated, usually infinitely generated um, by um, framed links whose projections have no crossing. We saw, just saw that e earlier, right? So if you have no crossings, you can't do anything with it. It turns out those are all linearly independent. And I say usually because there's always those exceptional cases up there, right? Uh, right, right, right. Over z adjoint squared or true, right there. And if you allow algebra multiplication, then you don't need as many in generators. You can get by with many fewer. Um, this is more or less everything that was known at the end of the 1990s. Um, everything else, like whether it was um, had zero divisors, what if there were other commuting elements, all of those things was just this big, big black hole. No one knew what was going on because the multiplication was so hard, right? Because when you multiply things, you're all of a sudden you have these like linear combinations of pictures, and then. Right? It's not something that's easy to stuff into a computer, for example. Yeah? Is representation of the here enough to affect the effect? No. Um, not for the Witten one, but for other representations, we'll see some, some later. Is it like the fundamental group is the basis? And well, it's not quite the fundamental group. It's a little bit more, right? Is it, is it the fundamental group? No, not quite. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, for example, um, like in for the torus, right? Um, as a module, you could you would um, take all possible uh, PQ torus links, right? So you allow multiple copies of them. That'll give you a basis. Um, if you want a generating set, you need only three. The one that goes around this way, one zero zero one and one one. So it's not quite the same, although it's very very closely related. I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Okay. Uh oh. Switch out the, the battery. Sure. Sorry. No problem. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And let me see if I can hang this off my dress again. All right. There we go. Oh, you're welcome. Okay. Other questions? Okay. Um. In like the last, so that was what was known in in the 90s, and then like within the last five, ten years or so, uh, five years or so, I would say, all of a sudden we have all these extra things that we know about the algebraic properties. We know it has no zero divisors, it's Noetherian, it's almost Azumaya, and actually we know everything in its center. So this is kind of very exciting for quantum topologists, and um, I'll give a hint of how some of these things are proved as we go along. Okay, all right, so ready for some hyperbolic geometry. Okay, so um, it's a little bit surprising. You'll have to, um, it's not obvious at all. Okay, so suppose I have a surface with finite topological type. All I mean is oriented, connected, um, compact, maybe closed uh, with finitely many punctures. So just finite. Um, and 
we can consider its Teichmuller space, which is all the possible um, isentropy classes of complete metrics on that on that sur on that surface. So here I have a genus two surface. I can think of it as being um, an octagon glued together. Because I'm thinking about it geometrically, um, that octagon I can think about geometrically as a, as an octagon in hyperbolic space, right? And depending on what shape this octagon is, um, I have different metrics. Okay, so really, what what am I doing? I'm lifting to the universal cover, which is H two, and looking at everything geometrically, right? Um, Instead of thinking of it as shapes of octagons, I can also think about it instead as um, a, represent a, a homomorphism from the fundamental group to the isometry of H2. So you look to the universal cover, right? Um, and um, that octagon will tile the, universal, you know, the hyperbolic plane. Right? Um, for every loop in your fundamental group, that'll give you a deck transformation upstairs, right? That deck transformation is um, an isometry. Um, and so instead of isometry of the hyperbolic plane, I can think Mobius transformations or a matrix in L2R. Okay. And the conjugation, instead of, um, and so remember, if you look to the hyperbolic cover, every DAC transformation is the same up to change in base point, right? And so downstairs here, it corresponds to up to conjugation. Okay, so that's, um, so instead of thinking about hyperbolic metrics, it's much, I guess, shorter to think about instead these maps from the fundamental group into PSL2R. So towards that end, um, we consider this thing, which is the set of all um, maps from the fundamental group into SL2R. And I kind of cheated there. I lifted from PSL2R to SL2R because that makes my life easier. And um, actually, I'm going to do a little bit more. And I'm going to complexify because complex numbers are easier than real numbers because they're a field. And so um, this thing is now the SL2C character variety. Um, it's The advantage is that it's an algebraic variety. So you can do algebra on it. And it's what, and still, it contains a copy of the Teichmuller space inside of it. Okay. Um, just to be absolutely clear, these double bars um, basically mean that this thing contains characters, right? It's not, you shouldn't think of them as um, maps from pi 1 of sigma to SL2C, but really as characters of them. So any two maps up there are the same in this space if their traces are the same. And so that's why it's called the character variety. So um, in this space, um, you can define for every loop, there's these trace functions. Okay, So it's not quite the same as trace. So for every, you pick a knot in your surface, and you can say, OK, it defines a map from the SL2C character variety to the complex numbers. Basically, you take the metric, right, r at that knot, and then you take the trace. These numbers are, um, these trace functions encode all sorts of things about the metric. So for example, the length of k um, under, the, with, according to the metric r, um, various shear coordinates. It's um, very hyperbolic, it encodes a lot of hyperbolic geometry information. So the trace functions, turns out that they generate the space of all regular functions on the SL2C character variety. Okay. And um, the key observation, um, here that ties um, the SL2C character variety with the skein algebra is it turns out, um, and this is a complete surprise, um, or actually unexpected, not necessarily surprise, well, I guess an unexpectedly is surprise, um, that these trace functions satisfy the skein relation. Okay, so if you take this trace function along this knot and then the trace function along that knot, it satisfies the skein relation from the skein algebra. Um, it's just easier. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> um, I think maybe so part of it is that you can um, think of these. I'll, I'll think about it and answer it hopefully in a bit. Um, the skein relation actually it turns out to be just um, fudging around. 
Um, yeah, so we have the trace identity. And it turns out that the skein relation is just a rewriting of this. You have to mess around um, with which side of the equation things are, which are why that you have these extra minus signs. But it works out. It's, it's actually exactly the same. Okay. Um, and so this was, and um, the other thing that's a little bit interesting here is that um, with this minus one, it turns out that, right, so um, having over and under crossings are exactly the same, which kind of makes sense, right? Because if you're thinking about this SL2C character variety, it, they're maps on the fundamental group of a surface, right, which has no thickness, right? So crossings are just crossings. There's no over and under. And so if you want to think about skein relations, you need over and under, and over and under should be the same because it's, we're going through this fundamental group, and so this kind of really does make sense that this should happen. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah, there's also the other choice of Q equals plus one, which you could choose as well, but then it's like, becomes all sorts of complicated spin structure stuff that. If this already happens, it's Q equals plus one. Yeah, that's right, that's right. And it, and in fact, I think only happens when Q equals plus one. So, um, yeah. So this was discovered, this, um, Revelation uh, was in the late early 90s. Um, Bullock, from and Kanya Bartosinsky and Prashitsi Sikra. And what they say is that there's actually an isomorphism, and basically what we said there, where every knot, if you assign to it the trace function that corresponds to that knot, that gives you an isomorphism between the skein algebra with q equals 1 and the, um, the regular functions on the SL2C character variety. <laughs> so, yeah. um, so another way of understanding this line is to kind of take the dual. Um, so instead of thinking about complex functions on the, our, um, the, the character variety, you can think about the point in the character variety corresponding to um, maps from the skein algebra to the complex numbers, right? So, um, yes, I think basically it's uh, this. You just need to make sure that that works out going both ways, and that's it. Uh, you may also need to know that there's no nil potents, and so that might be a little bit harder. Yeah. Um, okay, so this clearly begs the question, right? So this was commutative, right? This is commutative, whereas if I make Q not be one, then it's not commutative. Can I think of the skein algebra with the generic Q as some kind of non-commutative deformation of this whole stuff, right? And the answer is yes. Okay. Again, this is so. This was noticed by Turayev in the early '90s um, that if you take a commutator in the skein algebra, so over under minus under over, you get something that looks like that. And if you plug in q to the e to the two pi is is uh, e to the two pi i over h bar, take a Taylor expansion, then you get something here, right, related to these two guys, right, and that something there turns out to be exactly the same formula as Goldman's bracket calculation for the Poisson bracket. Okay, it's it was like okay, this is awesome. Right, something must be going on here. And so one way of um, rephrasing all of this, um, these observations. Yeah. Ah, there's also the. <laughs> on the entire character variety. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I know what you're, you're saying. Um, Yeah, but I think it's true. Um, or at least you can generalize it so that it, it works out. So, um, so yeah, so, so basically what happened? Um, if you think about the skein algebra, it has that skein relation, right? Um, Overcrossing Q half resolution number one plus Q to the minus half resolution the other one, right? So in, in SQ1, that's one, you can perturb that skein relation a little bit and make it non-commutative. Right? And so that's exactly what that, this is saying, is that if you perturb the skein relation to make it, to get the, the, the non-commutative version, this is really like a non-commutative version. Okay? Um, 
it's not really a non-commutative version of the character variety. It's really a non-commutative version of the complex <laughs> regular functions of the SL2C character variety, but OK, whatever. OK, so another way of thinking about this, um, just to recap, remember, um, by taking duals, a point a character in the character variety corresponds to um, this map up here, right? We saw that before. Um, another way of thinking about this is this is a rep one dimensional representation. So a point in the quantization is a any dimensional representation. Okay. Sorry, the thing about map to C was the value of Q. Is, oh no, any value of Q. Uh, oh, wait, right, right, right. The map to, oh, this was a one here. Yeah. You're right. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. Yeah, that's a one there. Um, and just linguistically, often this is abbreviated to the Skane algebra as a quantization of type Miller space, even though it's not really. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It, yeah, and when they talk about quantization, they don't really mean type Miller space. They mean um, the character variety. Okay, um, this is one quantization. So tuck this away. I'm going to talk about a different quantization just quickly. Um, and this other quantization comes from the theory of, of quantum cluster algebras. Um, and so there's a different, so taking non-commutative versions of things, this isn't like a standard theory. It's very hard to, you know, it's which one's the right one. So there's more than one way to do it. So here's a different way. Um, and this different way looks also um, somewhat similar. So in this different way that's based on quantum cluster algebras, you take a surface with at least one puncture, and the one puncture, the puncture is needed because you need really need an ideal triangulation. So this is a triangulation of the surface where the vertices are at the punctures. Right? And um, if you do that, yeah. Yes. Well, so this, this thing was known in the 1990s, right? And so the thing that I'm going to talk about next is the new technology that will help us prove the new algebraic topo properties. And yes. <laughs> yes. Um, I don't really think about them as cluster algebras. I, it's, I'll, I'll explain in a second. Okay, so. So there's a completely different quantization um, that is a little, that's uh, um, somewhat more recent. So you take a surface with one puncture with an ideal triangulation, and then you need the puncture to get the ideal triangulation. And if, ah, this was a mistake. If this should be a hypermodeling metric, so that should be type Miller space. <laughs> so um, if I um, have a hyperbolic metric, I can kind of encode everything in the me metric by how tri these triangles are glued together. Right? All ideal triangles have the same size, and so when I glue them together, that's when I get this different shapes. Um, and so these, for every edge, there's a certain amount of shearing, right? And this shearing, um, so, so in other words, for every edge, there's a number, right? And um, if you look at these trace functions, they're all polynomials in these numbers these shear numbers. So another way of rephrasing all of that is, OK, the trace functions generated the algebra of, of regular functions on the SL2C character variety. These functions are polynomials in these shear numbers, right? And so these shear numbers, if I now think of them, about them as variables instead of as numbers, now I can think of them as parameters, a parameterization of that thing, right, of the algebra of functions. Did that make sense? That like went with a lot of language. Okay, so, um, so the key here is that, okay, you have this algebra of functions. I have these shear parameters. In this formulation, those shear parameters commute, right? So I want to find a non-commutative version of stuff, right? So what am I going to do? I'm going to make these guys not commute, okay? Um, and so here's the not commuting version. Okay, so, and the definition is very, very simple, right? So you just, so before I had a shear parameter for every edge, now I'm just going to take a random variable, this thing variable called zi for every edge, 
and I'm going to make them not commute. But I'm going to make them not commute in a way that is kind of comes from the combinatorics of the triangulation. So if I have two edges that share a triangle, then they Q-commute, right? depending on wh whether it's on the left or right. right. If they don't share a triangle, then they commute. Okay, It's just super easy to write down. You see the combinatorics of the ideal triangulation. You write this thing down. You know all everything about its algebra. Um, there's some annoying stuff about change of variables <laughs> right? when you change ideal triangulations, but I always just sweep that under the rug. Just ignore that for now. So um, here's the theorem. So here's a theorem that says that this quantization right, is compatible with my earlier quantization, at, right, with the, with the trace functions and perturbing the skein relation. Here, I'm making things skew, Q commute when before they didn't, and all this, and um, and so. I have no idea. <laughs> well, I mean, I know in the sense of in the sense of triumph. Yeah, I don't like here. It's like okay, you make something. It's to me, it seems like a non-commutative version of right. But then it's no. There's no standard, as far as I know, way that you always do this and it always works. But I, it could be because I just don't understand quantization and quantum theory as well. You know. Well, Um, uh, so in this talk, a non-commutative version of the function of regular algebra is on. So it's not really a quant. You put some parameter special on it, and then you get the commutative version, and you have the deformation you have, but no extra consistencies. Uh, that's the thing: is what are the extra consistencies, right? What am I? Yes. I wish I had a good answer for you. Um, yeah. So here, the advantage of um, so before we already saw this skein algebra as you know perturbing the um, the the trace identity right on SL two C character variety to get something that is not commutative right. Whereas over here it was something to do with like parameters and algebras and parameterizations. However, this um, injective map is um, kind of is okay. So there's two. There's pluses and minuses of this injective map. So it says that they're related, right? That the two quantizations are related. Um, it's super not great because it's really hard to define. So like I could try and try and define it for you, but it could. It's like a lot of just technical. Like you have to do this, and then you have to do this, and then you have to do this, and then you have to do that, right? So it's not easy to define. But on the other hand, it's super explicit. Like it's something I do. Okay. So. There's some list of rules that I have to follow. I follow the rules, and then I get this answer at the end. So that's great. Um, and the advantage, the, the, what do you get out of it at the end? The, the thing you get out of it at the end is um, multiplication in the skein algebra was horrendous. right? You put two links on top of each other, resolve all the possible different ways, lots of pictures, have no idea what's going on. Now you're embedded into this algebra, which is really easy to state. All the rules are explicit. Right? You just write down a bunch of you know, Zs right? and linear combinations of Zs, and you can manipulate them. You can stuff it into a computer. The computer knows what to do with it. Right? And so um, this, that's the advantage of this map, right? is that you get you know, an algebraic handhold on something that was difficult before. So uh, on the one hand, it's really, really complicated. On the other hand, it's a little it's simple, but it's kind of puzzled out. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I think there is, um, in and there's been uh, work since this about from Tong Lei where it's a lot more geometric, where you, you can glue surfaces together, and then the the this map will glue in some predicted way. And so there's, yeah, in I think there is. Um, it's just not so easy. No, it's just, yeah. It's, 
so why is it complicated? So the obvious thing you would do somehow is we have these shear coordinates, right? So you have a knot. And so the obvious thing you want to, that the, the first thing you would try is this, as it passes through the triangles, it hits all these edges, right? And you have a shear, shear coordinate for every edge. And so you, the, the, the thing you want to do is follow the knot. And as you hit, you follow the knot in the, in the order of the xi's or zi's that you see, right, in sequence. It turns out that doesn't work. And so what you need to do is to decompose the surface into triangles. And in each triangle, there's some height. And so you deal with that in order of height. And then you have to group the triangles together. And so it becomes this huge mess. Um, Yeah, 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 yeah. Otherwise, <laughs> that's useless. Sorry, it's a homomorphism. Exactly. Um, the homomorphism part is what's hard. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, summary. Things to take away. Skein algebra is a quantization of SL2C, um, what, whichever version you want to think about it. SL2C character variety, function of algebras on the SL2C character variety, Tychmuller space, take your pick. Um, there's two versions that I talked about. In one version, again, there's a typo here that's a one. Um, it's these representations, right, um, correspond to points in the quantization. Um, and then there's also another one where there's this quantum Tychmuller space, which is algebraically easy, and there's an injection. Okay. So for the rest of the talk, I want to con um, understand here. So if you remember back in the 1990s, um, after Turayev's work, um, this part we knew already that these representations were interesting, right? That they would correspond to the things in the non-commutative deformation of it. The problem at that point was that there were just no examples of such a thing that we knew of or how to construct it. Um, there was one, the one that came from Witten, right? And then there's silly ones like map everything to the identity matrix, right? <laughs> and that was basically it. And so, um, the key now is what I, my, uh, we've been trying to do is understand what these representations are. Okay. okay. All right. So representations. So here's a theorem. Um, so if you have Q as an nth root of unity and n is odd, and I pick a surface that is reasonable, um, then if you give me a representation, right, then I can tell two representations apart by computing these things called the puncture invariant in classical shadow. So for every representation, you have some numbers that are associated to the punctures and exactly one point in the character variety. Okay? And it goes the other way. If I have, if you have me some numbers, one for every puncture and a point in the character variety, I can give you one representation of the skein algebra. Okay? So, um, so remember, SL2C character variety down here, a non-commutative ver version of it is the representation of the skein algebras up here, right? So what this says is you give me a representation, I give you a point in the, non in the commutative version. You give me a point in the character variety, I give you a representation up here. Okay? All right. Um, now this immediately begs the question, is this a one-to-one -one process, right? I, right? We can go from down up to, up to down and down to up. But is this one to one? Um, and so there are two. So, so there's certain points that are going to be problems. For instance, the, char the trivial character, the one that sends everyone to the identity matrix. So um, the, it turns out that Witten's, the representation from Witten's TQFT, that one corresponds to the trivial character. Our construction from our theorem also, it also, there's another one that corresponds to the identity character. We think they're different. We haven't quite um, verified that, but we're pretty sure they're different. Um, and so it's not going to be one to one everywhere. Okay. Yeah. It depends on the root of unity. But, but just on that. Oh, just on that, yeah. Yeah. Um, and. As of like July, <laughs> which is very recent, it, it turns out that this process is exactly one to one for a Zariski dense. So for almost everyone, okay, except for these really annoying ones that you see are clearly going to be um, exceptional. And actually, um, right. So what the so so now exactly so for a generic uh, 
character down on the bottom in this SL2C character variety. Um, so this is the commutative version. There's exactly one and only one non-commutative version of it upstairs. Okay. And this is not for everyone in the character variety, for basically everyone, though. Okay. Um, okay. So um, in order to prove this stuff, I'm going to have to go back to talking about the algebraic structure of um, the Stein algebra, and in particular, these cool things called Chebyshev polynomials. OK. <laughs> um, this is, OK, so Chebyshev polynomials are defined recursively. The first one, uh, the zeroth one is 2x, and then you do x squared minus 2, and then x times this one minus the previous one. Okay, and so you define them recursively. Um, these are super famous because they are related to cosine functions. If you wanted to write cosine of n theta as a polynomial in cosine theta, then these are exactly them. Um, they're also related to SL2C um, stuff because if you take the trace of a power, this is the Chebyshev of the trace. Again, very cool. Um, what's interesting here is that these Chebyshevs are not the Chebyshevs that appear in um, pre previous quantum invariant stuff. So in uh, Witten's TQFT, it talks about um, representations of VQSL2, which is the Chebyshevs of the other kind. Um, okay. And actually, our, our, the way we came up with our statement in the proof was because I misunderstood um, <laughs> I thought a torus with a puncture with the, was the same as a torus without a puncture, and um, Francis thought that these Chebyshevs were the same as the other Chebyshevs. So, like, it was a um, lucky, um, lucky mistake on both sides. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to do this to skeins, right? I'm going to make skeins complicated by using Chebyshev polynomials. Okay, so I have there a skein in the ones puncture torus, and over there I have some polynomial, which is a Chebyshev. And so what I'm going to do is what I call we call threading the, the knot by this polynomial. And I'm going to just notate it like this, OK? But really, it's this thing. So here it has x cubed. So I take three parallel copies. So it's three parallel push-offs in the direction of the framing. Um, and then minus 3 times one parallel push-off. Okay. So this makes skeins much more complicated very quickly, right? So for example, here I have one crossing. Here I have nine crossings. Okay. So that means that if I take um, a Kaufman bracket and I take resolutions, um, the original one would have um, two, right? That one had one crossing, so that had um, two resolutions. This one now, because n is three, has n squared crossings, right? with extra terms. And so now I have like 2 to the n squared, 2 to the 9 number of cross resolutions. OK. So here's the um, cool stuff. So if I thread, right, so here, this really means a linear combination of curves, right? So um, n push-offs minus, and then there's a whole bunch of other terms. If I put a skein threaded by Tn, Right? And then just any old other knot, it'll always pass through. Okay? So that means that it's commutative. Right? So if I take any knot, I thread by the nth Chebyshev, where n is exactly the root here, then I get something that's central. Um, and it doesn't stop there. Right? So if I thread both of them by Tn, right, then it satisfies the skein relation. Okay? And this is kind of amazing, because this one has n squared crossings. It means that if I have n squared crossings, I plug in q to be this root of unity, almost all of them disappear. Okay, and that's the um, miraculous cancellations that I was talking about in the abstract. Um, how do I prove this? I take this horrible thing called the skein algebra, I do this horrible thing, and I map it into the quantum Teichmuller space where I can check these identities using a computer, and all of a sudden, when you plug in a root of unity, all of them disappear, and then you know it's true. Right? You know these, these identities because it's injective work. How do you check it for um, You have a formula that's. Yeah. Uh, what do you mean? So when I plug, so there's formulas, right? It's just combinatorics, right? 
Yeah, yeah. that's right. That's our right, right, right to check in. And then, and then when our proof, our proof is actually by hand, and we have to write down formulas, and the formulas look horrible. And um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah, it's not a computer proof. Um, since um, so our proof is not pretty. I have to admit, it's really not pretty. Um, Tongle has a much nicer skein theoretic proof that um, does this, and it's nice, and it's pretty, and it's with pictures, and it's a lot simpler. Um, but part of the thing with the skein algebra is that you don't even know what you're, you want to prove until you know you know you know what the answer is, right? I mean, this is part of math. Okay, so um, so the so now I'm I think I'm ready to prove this theorem, or at least sketch it. Okay, with lots of lots thrown under the rug. Okay. Ah, so what's the theorem? Uh, <laughs> irreducible representation of the um, quantum skein algebra. I mean, uh, skein algebra of a surface, right? So not commutative. I can give you a point in the character variety, okay? And, and there's these numbers for every puncture. If I give you a point in the character variety, I can construct up here. Okay, so that's part one and part two. Okay. So the part one is, okay, so suppose I give you an irreducible representation. All right, so basically this is um, computing the central character. Okay, so I have these puncture loops. Remember, if I go around a puncture, it's really make it really, really small, then it commutes, right? So if I have a reducible representation, this little small puncture loop goes to a number, and that's the puncture invariant. Um, the character variety is a little bit more complicated, right? So here's, um, so I have a knot. Any knot I want, I um, threaded. Right, with the nth Chebyshev, the same capital N as the root of unity. It's central, so it gets sent to a number. This number will depend on k, right? the knot that you started off with. Um, furthermore, all of them, when you thread with n, satisfy a skein relation. So this means that if I take every knot and I assign it to that number from Schur's lemma, this factors through the skein algebra. right? And so I get this well-defined thing. But then there was that isomorphism. Remember the isomorphism from Bullock, Froben, right? So there's an isomorphism between these guys with the one um, with the character variety, right? And so now I have a point in the character variety. I have a classical shadow, and that's it. Okay. The other part. So suppose you give me puncture invariance and classical shadow. Um, the, Basic strategy is um, to take advantage of the algebraic structure of the quantum type Mueller space, right? Which was just generators with, you know, skew commute, um, two commute if they share edges, right? So I inject into quantum type Mueller space. The algebra here is super easy, right? You can figure out all the uh, representations of it, and so you just compose, okay? Um, because this thing here, um, the quantum type Mueller space was you know, had this shear coordinate stuff hit, right? It was, that was hidden behind it. You can, um, there's, it turns out that there's exactly one representation per choice of puncture invariant and quantum, um, and, and character, right? So, um, so you just compose. Now the problem, this is easy, right? Super easy when it's um, got a puncture. Ah, how do I use the puncture so that I can get an ideal triangulation, so that I can get the whole thing kick-started? So if I don't have the puncture, I don't have an ideal triangulation, I have no shear coordinates, I don't have the quantum type Mueller space, I'm in trouble. And so, yeah, so if I have quantum type Mueller space, I compose. If I don't, then I put in a bunch of, drill a bunch of um, punctures in, and then by some miraculous process, there's some invariant subspace, an eigenspace that is, doesn't see the punctures. We work really, really hard to make sure that that's true, and then you get them at the end. Okay, um, it's, yeah. So like I said, um, this quantum Teichmuller stuff is great, but it's also not very fun to work with. Um, in a um, 2016 preprint, uh, Froman and Kanya Partusinskaya um, come up with a different way of coming up with representations, and it's skein theoretic. It's much nicer. Um, it's, well, much nicer in the sense that, like, I like pictures as opposed to, um, you know, 
algebra manipulations. So to me, it's nicer. But to people who like algebra manipulations, the quantum Teich-Muller space is much nicer. Um, so there's a picture version. Um, and by the recent preprint in July, the, the, the constructions have to match up. It's not clear how they match up, but that's um, for a question for this year. Um, a lot of the algebra, algebraic properties that I mentioned earlier, no zero divisors, all of those things where you can prove through this injection. Um, this algebra has no zero divisors, so this gain algebra can't have any divisors. Um, and so basically the question now is where to go from here, right? So is how can we take like these representations, right, and kind of give them, right, tie together those quantum invariants that I was talking about in the beginning, Jones polynomial, Witten, TQFT. Is there some way of injecting hyperbolic geometry into that discussion? Um, and so thank you very much. If um, I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you.